appreciate you being on the call here today. Uh, pleased to introduce Aaron Domi of Powerline Group. Uh, he is going to be speaking today on petroleum risk management and will cover a couple of interesting topics. Got a chance to view the uh, slide deck prior to this of, of what he'll be uh, discussing, but, but essentially kind of th three main areas. One is OPEC uh, with all the supply and demand fundamentals that are changing out there in the market. He'll kind of step through um, some forecasts for us as well as tell us uh, some of the trends that are taking place in the industry. Uh, we know these Iran negotiations that have been taking place, uh, the tensions with uh, Saudi Arabia in, in terms of uh, refusing to, to cut production and, and OPEC and how that's driven down oil prices and really increased the uh, volatility for those involved uh, in retail or exposure to retail margins, the decline in crude prices have been very attractive for, for many and led to a profitable period. Um, and going forward, uh, Darren's going to provide us some, some in, insight in what we can expect. Uh, we'll also talk about a couple hedging strategies uh, that are out there, which is really the uh, specialty of, of what his firm does. Uh, so be pleased to hear him speak about a, you know, a few of those options that may be of interest uh, to folks as they work to manage their uh, petroleum risk. So a couple ground rules before I turn everything over to, to Darren. I've got you guys all uh, on the phone. Uh, you're muted uh, to prevent background noise from uh, muddling up the conversation. If you have a question, I'd encourage you to type it into your dialog box, which is on your uh, GoToWebinar panel. You should be able to type in questions there. I can see those, and then uh, we'll be able to read those and pass them on to Darren at the appropriate time. So we'd really like to try to answer your questions as much as we can. Uh, you can see the slide here on, on my screen that has Darren's contact information. We're going to record this broadcast and um, send out a link to everybody a day or two after the call. So if you want to re watch this or share it with a friend, um, et cetera, you'll have the opportunity to do so. So with that, uh, we'll, we'll jump right in. And Darren, I am going to uh, turn the controls over to you. And we should be able to see your screen here in, in just a second. And I, I can see your screen, Darren. So. Oh, perfect. Does that mean uh, everyone can see it now? E everyone can see your screen now, yeah. Fantastic. Jed, thanks for the introduction. And uh, ladies and gentlemen, I'm going to look forward to presenting some information here to you today. And I do look forward to your questions. So feel free to, to uh, type back to Jed, and then he'll be able to ask the questions as we go along. Uh, just to kind of get something out of the way right away, I do have to put a disclaimer up uh, required by the CFTC, Commodity Futures Trading Commission. When uh, we get time later, because of our constraints, I don't want to read through this to you, but please review it later. Uh, when you have this copy of this presentation in front of you. This is who you're talking to today. This is me. I'm Darren Domi with Powerline Petroleum. And just to give you a quick uh, synopsis on Powerline, we work with the petroleum industry and we specialize in hedging for sea stores and hedging those retail gasoline and diesel fuel margins. We also work with the end user trade or the end user fleet operators, uh, the end user transportation for diesel fuel, gasoline. And uh, if there's anything more you would like to see or discuss there, please feel free to email me or give me a phone call to discuss some other things. But uh, today, with our time constraints, I'd like to jump right into this crude oil market and discuss a little bit about what caused this uh, big collapse in this crude oil market. First of all, a lot of you heard a lot about horizontal drilling. And then just to give you a quick overview of it, uh, just so you've got a good visual understanding of what we're talking about, the old vertical wells here on the left drill just straight up and down and you got to punch it right into the hole and get lucky and get that get that uh, big gusher so to speak and hope that you got a good producing well as technology changed in the early 2000s they were able to take these wells and bend the drill bits or bend the pipes down into the ground and drill horizontally right into the production productivity area or into that oil hole and this really helped increase the production because now you're not just pulling oil from the left and the right, but now you're able to go in here and horizontally drill right into that pocket of wherever the gas and oil is. As time changed, 
they're able to come down in and drill that horizontally and then they come up with fracking so they can come down here and put a little explosive charge in the ground blow it up and create bigger cracks within the rocks and then they, it, when they blow it up it injects it with sand and it, and it lets that oil and gas pour down through and they're able to pump out more now some of the interesting things that I've heard over the over the years with this horizontal willing drilling is that some have told us that there's no such thing as a as a dry hole anymore. They pretty much know when they're going in to drill for these wells that they're going to be able to hit this oil and and uh, drill right into it where they need to go because they can directionally push that that pipe where they need it to go. Then they can go in there and they can frack fraction fractionate the rock, <clears throat> open up the pores and let the oil come in. And what happens is, folks, when they do this type of drilling, it immediately increases the amount of production that they have to come to market right away. In other words, you, from an old horizontal well, they drill straight down and if it was just something uh, of a normal well, you might get anywhere from 10 to 100 barrels a day in production. Some of this horizontal fracking, they can come in here and when they frack that rock and open all this up, some of these wells will produce 200 to 500 to 1,000 barrels a day immediately, but then they seem to drop off by as much as 70% after the first one to two years. So it opens it up and they get a massive amount of oil and that's what pays for these wells so quick and that's what brings this oil on so fast. Not to mention that at the top they sit here and they can put multiple horizontal wells down in here as well. Then what they've been doing is going back into the old horizontal wells and fracking those to get the, get them to produce more oil as well. This is what it's done in terms of production. The Permian Basin, this is West Texas, ladies and gentlemen. At one time they were averaging about eight, 900,000 barrels a day. Uh, when they start going out there with the horizontal and fracking, they're able to increase this clear up to about 1.8, 1.9 million barrels a day. Eagle Ford, which is South Central Texas, they were basically nothing. And when they started doing all this drilling back in 2010, they take this from basically little to no production to about 1.7 million barrels a day. And of course, all we hear about is the Bakken field up in North Dakota, Montana, southern Canada area. You can see that they were producing maybe 30,000 barrels of oil up in that area a day. But boy, once they brought this technology on, uh, you had all these little boom towns pop up out there in that North Dakota area and they go to about 1.3 million barrels of oil a day. So we're able to just ramp up our production here in the United States in a very short time. Look at this, from 2010 through 2014. So basically five years, we just really bring on the production. This is an interesting chart. This is the non-OPEC oil production, and this goes through November of last fall. What is interesting is the majority of all this non-OPEC production is United States and Canada. And the majority of all this is the United States. Canada is probably about 500,000 barrels a day of this. What's interesting is, look at OPEC's production since 2005 through 2014. It's basically been sideways. <clears throat> OPEC has had the same opportunity to the same cheap capital that we have had. They've had the same opportunity to the same technology as the United States has had. They have been raking in money hand over fist with $100 oil since 2010, but yet they have not taken this money and plugged it into their economies, increasing jobs, helping the young uh, and create those jobs. But what you're looking at here is old-fashioned American ingenuity of being able to take uh, a, new, a new technology and put it into use with the available capital and risk-taking that, that you're looking at. You go back into this 2006, 7, 8 area, uh, Saudi Arabia used to produce about 2.4 million barrels a day more than we did. And today, the United States is producing 2.7 million barrels more than Saudi Arabia. So you can see that our technology, with this red line, has really just increased our production, where Saudi Arabia, for the last several years, uh, just can't seem to get over that 12 million, and they're producing roughly about 9.5 million today. Uh, but what you're seeing here, this was Hurricane Katrina, where it was shut in a lot of production right here. And then here, of course, was the 2008 going into 2009 uh, economic recession, where the production dropped. But you can see, as soon as things recovered, cheap access to 
low interest rate money just really helped fuel this boom and the economy. Here we are up through February. Yeah, I'll just yes. interject there real quickly. You can see it, I think, by these graphs why Saudis are so frustrated because here they've kind of voluntarily agreed to keep their production the same even though their cost of production may be five or ten dollars per barrel and the US whose cost of production is much higher, you know, maybe sixty to seventy dollars a barrel, you know, depending on who you talk to. And we've seen all the production increases and uh, the gains from that where they voluntarily kept, you know, their production relatively constant uh, to tar benefit and their disadvantage. That's true. And then a lot of ours, of course, is by private companies and private individuals. So it's hard to go in there and shut those individuals down or make agreements and arrangements with them. Uh, and then, of course, Saudi, Saudi Arabia is, is, a, is a, you know, the nation's own oil input. So they can control it themselves. But what's interesting is, look at this. All the way through the end of February, our production continues to increase. This is what's so interesting. Even with the price collapse in oil, we've had so many wells put into place and so much new horizontal type oil to come to the market that look at the sharp increase yet. Here we are again. And then this is with Russia. Notice Russia hasn't even increased their production very much over the last several years. And they've had access to the same cheap interest rate money and the same technology. But again, the United States really took this and ran with it and increased that production. You've got to remember that the Saudi Arabia, when you look at the difference here from a 2.4 to 2.7 million, that's as much as 30% of the exports that Saudi Arabia was sending to us. And here, look at this. This is our export, or our imports here to the United States. Here we are going into this 2008, 2009, uh, 2007 time frame right in here. We were importing at about 6.3 million barrels a day. The recession comes along and slows that down. But at the same time, this is the same point where all the production increased dramatically from the United States. And it, it just kept slowing our imports up. We no longer needed this oil uh, to run our own refineries. And as you can see, this is through April of last week. And we are now down to uh, the lowest level since 1987, which is very interesting. I mean, you're down to about 2.6 million barrels a day from 6.3. So you can see why it's hurting Saudi Arabia, that we've got to find a new market. And as long as China and their economy and, and the other Asian countries and then those BRIC countries that were coming along continued to grow, it didn't seem to bother Saudi Arabia so much. But once the world economy started to slow up, China finished filling some of their SPR reserve, the BRIC countries all of a sudden started having some problems, then next thing you know, Russia or Saudi Arabia is having a hard time trying to find a new place to take this oil. Then not only that, you also had Russia coming in there and trying to make backdoor deals with, with the Chinese. So now, will OPEC make a production cut in their June meeting? That's what everybody wants to know. Is the price of oil gone low enough that it's actually going to bring them to their knees? And then what are the effects if they do or do not? Well, this one chart right here is pretty much going to answer this, even though I have a few to follow up after. And then, Jed, can you still hear me very clearly? I can, yeah. Okay, perfect. This is Iran's crude oil production. As you can see, when we went into sanctions and started putting the sanctions on, they were around 3.7 million barrels a day. Because of their, their desire to continue to produce nuclear fuel, they put these sanctions on them, not allowing most countries to buy their oil. China, India, and a few others continue to buy from them. They drop their production down to 2.5. We go to lift a few of the sanctions. They're back up to 2.75. Now, our administ Obama administration is bent on approving their nuclear fuel talks and whatever. They're trying to give Iran the ability to come back in here. And as soon as they approve, approve them on the nuclear talks situation, uh, Iran has the ability to increase production back up to 3.5 to 3.7 million barrels a day. So that's going to add 1 million barrels of oil a day to the market. That could be very bearish. Iran also has 30 million barrels of floating oil <clears throat> sitting on those VLCCs, those very large crude carriers. Each one of those holds about uh, 2 million barrels of oil. 
So you can see that there's a lot of oil that could hit the market immediately, and Iran would love to get their market share back. The biggest problem right now is Saudi Arabia. Saudi Arabia does not want this deal to be done between the United States. They don't want these sanctions to be lift, lifted. Then you have Iran also causing problems in Yemen, and Saudi Arabia is also having to go in and fight this war into Yemen. There's really not much support for this deal out of the Middle East, contrary to what you continue to hear on the news. Uh, not only does, uh, obviously, Israel doesn't want it, Egypt doesn't want it, Saudi Arabia doesn't want it, but boy, our administration sure wants to push this through. And if it does go through, you can see that we're going to have a lot more oil to come and hit this market. And then what's going to happen if we start getting uh, the oil back out of, out of Libya and a little more production out of Nigeria? As it is right now, those two countries will probably be tough to get back online, but uh, Libya may be able to add as much as a half a million barrel, barrels of oil fairly quickly. So right now, the talks are, are, are being tabled, it's my understanding, until June. So this is going to be very important. This will hit about the same time as that OPEC meeting. But I can tell you right now that Saudi Arabia uh, is in no mood to make any deal with any other OPEC member, uh, especially knowing that they've got all this oil coming from from Iran. Saudi Arabia has built up huge uh, coffers here. They've got $733 billion in reserve funds to help cushion them uh, from this blow. The majority of the country's budget comes from oil sales, proceeds, and current rate. They are only running at about a $39 billion deficit. So this allows them to keep production the same and fight for market share. So even though the price of oil has dropped substantially, they're still only coming up about $39 billion short on their budget deficit, but yet they've got $733 billion, of which the majority of it is sitting in U.S. dollars. So even though the price of crude oil collapsed, the U.S. dollar has gained in percentage about the same value, uh, has gained about 20 to 25 percent in value, where crude oil originally lost 60-some percent of its value, 61 percent to be exact, and then I don't know if you're aware of this or not, but crude oil is as much as 25% off its low uh, of that $43 per barrel level. Today, crude oil traded up almost to the $40, $54 per barrel level, and uh, that puts us at about 25% off the current low. And a lot of that strength today is coming from the ideas that uh, are news that the API DOE report may not show much of a build of, if any, in the uh, DOE stocks report at Cushing for ideas that the Gulf Coast refineries are coming back up off of maintenance and buying quite a bit of oil right now to get their production started. Uh, but that still doesn't s stop the situation uh, that we're still building stocks at Cushing, and which we'll show you that as we go on. But so what I want to show you is uh, look at the Aaron, quick yes. question here. So you're saying Saudi, by holding uh, their reserves in U.S. dollars, they've got a a partial, not a full, but a partial hedge in place because um, of crude oil prices decline, which is bad for them. Generally, the, the U.S. dollar would be strengthening relative to other currencies, and so in part offsetting some of that decline. Exactly. And I don't have a chart in here uh, overlaying the dollar over crude oil. I wish I did because I want to point something out as I show you a chart of crude oil here in a few more charts. Actually, the dollar bottomed on the, almost the exact same day that crude oil topped out last June, uh, which is very interesting. And I'll make a few more remarks on that as I flip a few more slides. But uh, something to show you here is look at the foreign reserves in crude oil. Obviously, Saudi Arabia's got $733 billion. Uh, you know, look at where they were in 2009. Just having crude oil hovering in that $100 per barrel level, level on that London Brent price just really filled up their coffers. I mean, they've got money stuffed all over the world, probably loaned out out through the Middle East, and it's building those skyscrapers, obviously. But here you look at Russia, and it looks like they've got a lot of money in there. They've got almost uh, $380 billion or somewhere in that vicinity, but they have a much larger budget, and they, they have a much larger budget deficit problem. They are, and their, their ruble has collapsed. Uh, it's, it's lost a great deal of value, and this number is being drawn down at a very pace for Russia. So they're going to run into problems much faster than anybody like Saudi Arabia. And then you look down here at the far end, Venezuela, oh, they've got some serious problems. Uh, they're not going to be able to hardly meet budget, let alone 
Ecuador, Oman, some of these other countries are just so small, they don't have very big budgets anyway, so they're going to be able to, to do pretty well. Here is a uh, oil rig count chart in red. So we had these rigs clear up to 1,600 rigs out there drilling for oil. Look at this. Here we are prior to the recession, 2008. You drop the rig count by as much as 60%. All right. You drop this down into this 200 level. Cheap interest, new drilling technology, and the oil companies and these individual oil catters are just coming out here wanting to drill. Looks like it tops out a little bit with oil in the 2012. Uh, technology continues to get cheaper. Improvement shows stability, cheaper interest rates, quantitative easing. Banks are coming back in here freeing up more money. You continue to go and, and uh, drill more wells. You have no idea in a macro picture or even a local picture. The United States, believe it or not, since 2009, has not added one full-time job. We've added 2.9 million part-time jobs, and we've added, I think, 17 million people since 2009, but not one full-time job. You know what? Look, think about this. In the state of Texas, North Dakota, Montana, South Dakota, all this production was adding jobs, high-paying jobs. We were, in other words, when I say not adding, we were losing jobs at the same time we were adding. So it's been a wash. But look at these. These have been really good, high-paying jobs for these guys out in these oil fields. Now that these rate counts are collapsing in here, our oil production is still increasing. And what the oil rig count is, is future oil to come to the market. It has nothing to do with your current production until we reach this point to where this will top out. All right. In other words, we're, we're about there now. And then it's going to be hard for us to bring new oil to the market when you've got a rig count that's almost been cut in half. All right. So yeah, this how has long nothing. How do you think that'll that'll take um, for us to feel the effects of the lower oil rig counts? I think you're still. It, it's still probably going to be into the end of this year. It'll be probably the fourth quarter before you start seeing a bigger slowdown in some of the U.S. production. But at the current price of oil trading above $50, and the London Brent price trading at 58 to 60, even out into the forward curve, you're not going to shut a lot of current production down or in. So what is going to have to happen is, is we're going to have, and as I go on, we're going to have to fill our storage up here in the United States. So we're starting to see maybe a little bit of topping out, and this is just a blown up of April uh, 14 through January of 2015. So, you know, we've had some topping out action here before on the production, but could this be the start of it? Now, here's what I'm getting to, Jed, is that we are now sitting at 478 million barrels of oil, including the S excluding the SPR reserve. George Bush filled all 700 million barrels of SPR reserve back in the early to mid-2000s at about $36 a barrel. And now today we're filling up all this remaining above ground storage, Cushing, Oklahoma, Gulf Coast, some on the east. But we're up to 471 million barrels of oil. And all this came about here just right after the end fourth quarter of the year. And a lot of this has to do is the world economies all of a sudden just came to a screeching halt. In China, in Europe, it actually started in Europe, and in China and Asia and South America. Then we just started to slow things down here in the United States as well. You can see here that also our days, these are, these are days of supply, are at their highest level since the mid-1980s. So we're now sitting at a 30, almost a 28 to 29 day supply of oil. So we continue to fill storage. But you have to remember this storage number is getting higher and higher, but we've also built a lot of storage out there in Cushing as well. And if you look at the uh, DOE report for the last several weeks, we, we're building it, uh, there's 6 million. 4 million, 7, 8, 10. Uh, here's last week's 4.76. You know, we built another, what, 4.4, I should say, last week. And then tomorrow they're looking at maybe only a million barrel build in Cushing. Uh, here's what's interesting. Cushing, Oklahoma stocks. They're sitting at 58.9. Let's just call this 59 million here today. That's 21 million barrels over the five-year average. 
what you're looking at here is that this capacity, even though it's been added to and built over the last several years, your working storage, in other words, 15% of a tank, they say, cannot be filled. They say that it, as the temperature is warm, the oil expands, and you have to, you can only fill a tank 40, uh, up to 85% of its capacity. So there's 15% there that you cannot fill. There's said to be 85 million barrels of storage capacity out there, but working storage is, eight, is about 70.8. Last week, uh, the week before, this chart is one week old, it was 54. And as you can see by this, we're pushing 59 million. So if we're at 59 million on an inventory level, that's going to take the 77% right up to 80% of capacity at Cushing. So if we continue to build at about 3 million barrels for the next several weeks, you're going to have Cushing, Oklahoma pretty much full. All right, now that's a, that's a big statement. Well, why is crude rallying today? Why is crude even rallying? You know, what's interesting, ladies and gentlemen, is that the fundamental picture today is visually worse than when it was last June when the market started to sell off. And it's substantially even worse than last, say, August, September when you started to break that $90 support level. But why isn't crude continuing to go down? Well, it's always the job of the futures market to factor these things out. And it always seems to precede whatever seems to be happening in the fundamental side of the market. However, there's other things we need to be looking at. As we're filling storage here in the United States, Iran, if they get to lift those sanctions in June, they're going to continue to fight for market share. It doesn't matter whether it's Iran, Venezuela, Russia, Ecuador. They're all going to try and produce as much oil as they can right now to meet their budget shortfalls. I don't know if you're aware or not, but last week they even said Iraq continues to increase its production. And Iraq is now 3.5 million barrels a day at a 30-year high in production. Last week, April 1st, it was reported that at Iraq's Basra port, they have a line of ships four miles long with a capacity of 50 million barrels. That's more than the 30 million that Iran has that, they, that they're renting in ships. Right now, those freight rates for those VLCCs is going through the roof. It's like at a three or four year high. And you're like, what in the world? Why is freight rates going up? Well, they've got nowhere to go with this oil. So now they're putting it on these ships. And the carrying charges have been wide enough recently that it's been paying for these large companies in these countries to come in there and put the oil on these ships. And it's definitely been paying to put this oil into storage in Cushing or the Gulf Coast. But once we hit this full capacity in another few weeks or get right up to it, you've got nowhere to go with this oil. And the problem is, even if you're only 80%, you could call that full because what happens is these large companies, maybe it's J.P. Morgan, Wells Fargo, Goldman Sachs, they go and lease this space and they may not put oil in it. It's full. You can't get access to it unless they're going to charge you <clears throat> an obnoxious rate to fill that storage. So then what's going to happen is you're just going to have to discount the heck out of the spot price to keep your well producing. And, and folks, if you've got a line of four, four miles long, now granted, some of this is due to bad weather. They've had a lot of bad winds and haven't been able to unload or load some of these ships out into the water. But they're filling a lot of it just because they've got nowhere to go with it and they want to keep their production going. So as it is right now, ladies and gentlemen, I don't feel as of April 7th, you're going to see Saudi Arabia, basically who is OPEC, listening to any of the cries by the bottom half of wanting to come in here and cut production. Nobody can really afford to almost cut it at this point because of their budget shortfalls. Even if they made a cut, I don't know if you'd get a rally big enough in the price of oil to offset their own lost production. With this big drastic fall off you had here in price, this started here in June. And I wish I put would have went ahead and put this chart up, but the US dollar also bottomed just about on this same date. And I, I don't know if a lot of you are, are aware of what happened <clears throat> at that time, but Europe came in with a quantitative easing program last June. In that same month, their, their own, what's, what's known as their own Federal Reserve, cut their interest rates to the other banks to a negative rate. 
what that did was it discouraged them from holding any money or, or investors wanting to leave any money in the banks. They all fled from Europe, started buying dollars, and putting money into our own stock market in the United States, which helped feed that market, push that price higher. But all these other foreign currencies needed to buy dollars to hedge off their risk. And hence, it just kept feeding the dollar. And as the higher the dollar would go, the lower the pr price of crude oil would go. So we've lost 61% of the value in nine months. They traded down to as low as 42.03. Today, as of right now, you're pushing right at $54 a barrel right now. And uh, so that's about a 25% of barrel increase. But as it is right now, if you're going to continue to trade sideways and stabilize in this area, I don't see Saudi Arabia making any desired cuts at this time. And it's going to continue to fill up the storage, which means we're going to have another break here later on, which with this kind of price volatility, folks, in the, in the bearish fundamentals that you're looking at, it makes it really difficult to come up with a good hedge program and understand what you want to do from a risk management standpoint. Well, if we've got this much oil and we're filling our coffers full to the brim, why are we 25% off the low? Well, why are we not taking it low enough to cut this production here in the U.S. to discourage more uh, marginal production, to shut some wells in? Uh, but right now as it is, the U.S. has also become the refinery to the world. And what they're doing is they're taking their cheap oil and they're turning it into gasoline and diesel fuel. And they continue to export all, all the gasoline and diesel fuel that we can make at this time. But with this kind of volatility that you're going to continue to see, we may rally this market on up to 58. But then we're going to head back down here as we go into June. Now to shift gears on you a little bit, how we want to handle this kind of volatility in the future how some companies are handling it, some of these large commercial hedgers. And what, what we want to do is introduce you to a new innovative hedging idea. Hey, Darren, it, but before yeah. you change gears, there's just one question from the audience I, I thought was relevant to the, the discussion here. But uh, the question is, how can an OPEC country make up a budget shortfall by producing more oil only to park that oil in all the VLCCs on the water? Doesn't that further widen their shortfall as they have the production costs but no revenue from the oil in the VLCC? Yeah, they still need to, they really, really don't want to shut down the oil or shut down the, uh, the pumping capacity because then it's very, very difficult to bring those wells back online. But they're, to try and make up their budget shortfall is they're cutting other programs elsewhere and they're burning through any kind of liquid cash that they do have at this time. But what they're trying to do is put that oil into storage somewhere so that they can use it at a later date. And by putting it into storage, they're trying to keep it out, help keep some of it off the market. But I, as far as Iraq goes, they are trying to go out and find new markets for this excess oil, which in turn is starting, will in turn drive this price down. So as they get, as they increase their own production, of course you're seeing some fall off in some of these other countries. But Iraq is trying to go out and bid and buy for market share. So eventually you're going to see this spot market have another leg down. And I think you'll see it take out the $40 level and probably trade down into the mid to low 30s. Mm -hmm. So the short of it is, is your kind of outlook is potentially lower oil prices than what they are now. All the fundamentals, in your words, are, are bearish. Point yes. Supply outstrip yeah. demand. And pretty much what you're seeing right now is, is – uh, short covering in the market, and the demand is mostly being led by the gasoline and diesel fuel markets, which are being exported. And that's why you don't see the same inventory level growth in gasoline and diesel as you see in the crude oil market. China continues to buy cars. They continue to want to drive. Uh, but it's not so much the oil they immediately need. They like to buy the refined fuel. So it's not only going to China, but it's going to all these other countries they can't meet these clean air standards that the U.S. refineries can. And you got to remember that China has such a smog problem, they're even talking about going to ethanol. And they only have a few ethanol plants in place as it is right now, and they're talking about uh, you know, a couple of years down the road, maybe importing more corn just to feed their own ethanol plants to clean up the smog. You've probably even seen the reports earlier this week that we are importing China's smog. Uh, in California, they were running some news that smog is increasing mostly because it's coming across the ocean, which I didn't get to see the full report, but I thought that was interesting. 
And I know Aaron, one more question, because I know you're wanting to get into some of these hedging strategies, which will be real informative. But uh, you talked briefly about oil being 25% off of its low. And um, with all these bearish fundamentals out there, why have we seen that bounce upward? Most of it is short covering. So you've had a lot of traders that were short and that had already sold the market and a lot of your large hedge funds and spec traders that sold the market previously, whether it was several months ago, six months ago, or only 30, 30 to 40 days ago. And what they're doing is they've been taking profit on some of those hedges. And then some of those new funds or traders that actually got short into January that were betting on the market to head on down haven't been able to see the market make these new lows, so they're buying back those positions. And hence, that's been helping to push the market up mm -hmm. a little bit in here. But right, you're not, you, yeah, you're not seeing, and, and the, you're not seeing a lot of fundamental buying of people wanting to buy and putting it in storage. But you have been seeing a huge amount of speculative cash going into the ETF, the USO, because uh, everybody thinks that once you do bottom this out, you're going to get a large run in the market. Normally, your first bounce is about 60% off of a low. Uh, this year, we figure it, you might be able to run this thing up into about a 32 to 38% retracement or a 38% rally off the low. Right now, you're at a 25%. So if you can run this thing up to $58 into that area, minus that low of 42, that's a $16 rally. Divided by 42, that's an exact 38% rally off the low. That's when you look at those kind of things, those are Fibonacci retracements. And the market has a tendency to trade those kind of things. So then we feel that you could see the market start to sell off again, especially in, a, in anticipation of no further cut. And you got to remember, last week, last Friday, there was only, what, 20, 20 rigs, 29 rigs uh, that uh, in the rig count that was, that was uh, halted. That rig count over the last several weeks has been anywhere from the upper 60s to 80s. So your rig count decline is slowing as well. Hmm. Your more efficient wells are going to continue to produce, especially $50 oil. And I don't have these other slides in here, but you do have a lot of these fields up in Bakken, as well as Eagle Ford and, and uh, West Texas, that can produce for $30 a barrel. So they're still making money. All right. One way to probably handle some of this volatility is it's very difficult to see this market turning and changing, especially when you're standing in front of this market and you see the market fall as much as it has. And then you're, you're, you're almost afraid to buy it down here. Oh my gosh, it just fell 60 some dollars. Uh, everybody's talking 30 to you know, $40 oil. What if it doesn't you know, stop or bottom right in here? We're gonna, you know, what if we continue to go? You're scared to death to buy it, especially after what you've just seen. One way to get around that, <clears throat> And this is where we've seen a lot of the market uh, and trading business go towards over the last two years, algorithm hedging. And when we at Powerline have developed an algorithm gasoline hedge trading strategy. And just to kind of tell you exactly what that is, an algorithm is a computerized mathematical formula written into a trading program that generates a buy and or sell order. And today, so you kind of know, uh, you, you may not realize this, but 80% of the exchange traded volume is algorithmic trading today. So computers are generating the buy and sell orders that a lot of people are, are putting in. So if people are wanting to place a hedge order and they're saying, you know, let the computer decide, is the market going up or is it going down? Because these computers are so fast today, and because of the language that can be written, written into them, these computers can take a look at the past trading formations and derive uh, whether the market is generating uh, upward momentum or downward momentum. <clears throat> Just to give you a, a bigger, broader view of what I'm trying to talk about, everyone has a GPS system in their car or on their cell phone or on their iPhone. You type in the direction of where you want to go, and your GPS system will tell you how it's going to get there. All right, that's no different than writing an easy language in your computer and asking where gasoline is going to go. 
Now, your GPS system will not even turn you on a road that's never been built, that's supposed to be built, but it has no idea where it's going to be. Where it's going to be. These computer-generated systems for trading are never going to tell you exactly where the market is going to go or what it's going to trade tomorrow, it's high and low. But what it can do is it can take a look back and see how the market has been trading and give a summarization of how it should continue to trade in the future, not how it will trade. All right. Even when you have your GPS system and you miss your turn, what does that system do? It tells you wrong turn, turns you around, and tells you what direction you need to go, exactly like an algorithm trading program. All right. If it's going in the wrong direction, it stops you, turns you around, and heads you either in the right direction or it stops you out completely. So what an automated algorithm hedge trading system can do for you if your hedge program is automated in the future, it can catch those unexpected price moves. For example, like that price low that the gasoline made uh, around that January 20th time frame and then rallied it clear into the end of February. Boy, not many of us were expecting that. It can be ready when you're not. The execution is fast, it's reliable, it's done by the computer, and it's cost effective in the fact that no more time delays are are trying to make risk management decisions. There's a lot of days all of us have seen where gasoline will start out two to three higher, but by the end of the day, it might be trading seven, eight higher. And we lose those opportunities to make some decisions. And lo and behold, it starts another trend or another trend up. The algo system can be quickly optimized and it can be back tested to adjust to different market conditions, just like you can with the GPS system. In other words, if the market starts to go into a tight trading range, instead of trading straight up or straight down, you can optimize the system to take a look back to trade in its more current fashion so that it will be able to function in the nearby the way it has been trading in the recent past. So it can optimize itself. What we like most is that it keeps your emotions out of the decision-making process. They're automatic. In other words, if you need to be long the market, it'll kick you into that long. If you need to be short, if the market's going to go on down, it'll get you into that short. When we were sitting here last fall, none of us felt that we would see this market drop as hard as we did under that $90 level. If we'd kept our emotions out of it, kept thinking there's no, we're not worried about whether there's support or resistance here, just let the system hedge our product for us got product in inventory, let's just take these short position hedges. If we're worried about our retail margins as the market goes up, boy, that long position in January would have done as well. So an algo hedging system can be used to automatically generate a long or short hedge position that is needed to offset a potential market price risk. It will take the mental emotion, as we've mentioned, out to buy or sell futures contracts that need to be established. An algorithm's long position can be an excellent hedge to protect the C-store against those tightening retail margins as the futures market goes up. We were all experiencing fantastic margins on the way down last fall and early this winter. But boy, when that gasoline market bottomed out, our margins really came crashing down. And they haven't been as good since. And then when the market rallied from that $1.22 low in the futures up to that $1.99, boy, our margins were getting pinched. Wouldn't it have been nice to be able to catch a long position there? The algo short positions can also act as a hedge against your physical gallons that you have in your bulk plant and your underground storage tanks at your C stores. What our commercial, large commercial hedgers tell us that are using this and have pushed us more to go this way and to look at a system like this in, in conjunction with some of our other hedge programs tell us that even though we're a natural long hedger, a transportation firm. They always need to be long diesel fuel. They say, we have actually become, we stay in the market all the time now, whether we're long or short. We've actually become a more efficient hedger. And I'm going to point something out again to you here in, in another minute. But this is best suited for petroleum jobbers, sea store owners, fleet managers that need to hedge around their gasoline use and other end users, any petroleum fuel user who has price risk in either an up or down market. 
Now let's take a quick snapshot of this. Now, before you start sitting here thinking that <clears throat> this is based on one contract, one futures contract, and it was test back tested over the last year and nine months, so basically in 18 days, so almost 22 months. But because you have to start somewhere, you have to go and pull historical data, whether it's either for your GPS system or whether it's for any kind of trading system or any other mathematical program, you need something to pull from. So you've got to search in the past data. How has something acted in the past to try and find out how it may result in the future? Okay, because we just finished this program and we've been working on it for months, I want you all to understand that when we back, we have to back test this. So these are not real trades except for the last three trades. So we're, I want you to understand they're hypothetical back test results instead of live trades over the last 22 months. But when you go in and you test these computers, you can put in all the variables, like the commissions, and slippage, and drawdowns, and things like that. And if you look at this system, over the last 22 months, it's had 55 trades. In other words, it's taken you long the market 20 different times. It's taken you short the market 35 different times. 54% of those trades are profitable, meaning that 45 or 46% of those trades have been losers. So that means that if the market does not do exactly what the trading parameters say it should do, then it immediately kicks you out of a position. All right. But of those 55 trades, and they're one 42,000 gallon contracts, and we have a commission rate set. We're showing it it's $42 a side or $84 a turn, which is two tenths of a cent. All right, leaves a net profit of $89,000. You netted $38,000 on the long sides, which you've used to help protect those retail margins, and you've made $50,000 on the short trades to help protect those those inventories. You would have grossed $112,000 on the profitable trades, but on the losing trades. You would have lost about 23,000, but here is a profit factor of 4.8. This is a huge number. Uh, when you find a, a system that can produce something over a 2.0 to where we can find an algo system to where the computer can go in and find something that produces a 4.8 ratio to where you're making $4 for every $1 you're losing. So you can take 4.88 times 22,995 and that's your 112. Just to show you something, the average profit on those 55 trades is $1,620 a trade. That's 1620 if you divide that by 42,000 gallons, that's a contract, you're averaging 3.8 cents a gallon. Your average winning trade is 3,700. 3, Your average losing trade is about 1,900, giving you a ratio of 4.0 again. Six consecutive winners in a row, this is how, how how technical and, and how much data the computers can pull out of their statistics when they need to go look and measure an algo trading system. And you've heard about these on the news. What you hear about mostly on the news is the computer systems that are trading in the nanosecond, the hypersensitive trading systems. Uh, they're buying on the bid, selling on the offer. And those computers are so fast trading stocks, commodities, and everything, that they can come in there and they'll buy something on the bid, and before the offer can change, it, it takes the sell side of the offer. Ours is d designed on a daily bar or on a day trading system rather than on a nanosecond. So the, the algorithms can be written to fit any time frame, whether it's daily, weekly, monthly, two-minute, five-minute, 30-second bar. But uh, because we're trying to design ours for a hedge strategy, to immediately get us in without emotion for a hedge structure, whether it be a long or a short, ours is set up on the daily situation. But as you can see, we've had six consecutive winners. There was four consecutive losers, just to kind of see how many it works in a row. The average winning trade lasts about five bars, which is five days. All right? Or the average trade is about five days. The average winning trade is a little over seven days you're caught into a losing trade about an average of two and a half, not quite three days. And again, it's trading one contract at a time. And then you can see futures commissions are about 4,600. And that's already been taken out up here on each trade. 
leaving you with a net profit of about 1620 or 3 cents a gallon. Now, if you take 55 contracts traded and divide that by the last 22 months, it's averaging about 2.5 trades per month. So if you're looking at making it about uh, 3.5 cents a gallon a month times 2.5, you're averaging about 8.7 cents a gallon per month in either direction of the market. And as you can see, it says that the, the minimum amount you would need, we need to ignore this. Uh, that would be the worst drawdown when the account would just start trading uh, based on the past history of this snapshot we were looking at. We require each account to start with a minimum of $15,000 per contract because there is a chance that you could hit three or four losing trades in a row. And you can see here, it's had four losing trades in a row at one time. But on a $15,000 initial capital, you can see that uh, oh, the returns over the last 22 months on that risk capital has been 594%. So if you take 15,000 times 594%, that's your $89,000. <clears> if you would have just bought gasoline and held it, and that during that same time frame, you would be down as much as 35, 36%. But when you're in here hedging it, it, the computer can also show you your returns versus a hold, buy and hold. So, Oh, your worst drawdown. This is what you need to know the most. The system is designed to limit your risk capital. So your worst drawdown or your worst loss from close to close on a trade was $3,528. And it was on a short trade, meaning a short hedge was put in place, but the market rallied and it kicked you out with a $3,528 loss. The largest uh, long trade loss was $1,800. So the, it's designed to take small losses, and, and if the market doesn't want to take off right away, it'll kick you out of a trade. What I want to show you is the last five positions, and what I want to show you here is on December 29th, it was short the market, and it bought it back on January 15th. It was short at 152.50, bought it back at 135.45 for $7,000 a contract. <clears throat> and these are 42,000 gallon contracts. So you can see if you were hedging 10 contracts or 420,000 gallons at a time, how this would change your P&L for your C store. And you came back, the system tells you that you need to be long on January 23rd. A lot of us are still standing there looking like deer in a headlight. Oh my gosh, I'm afraid to go long this market. But without emotion, the system will take you long. It took you long at 133.12, and it kept it till February 5th, and it got out at 149.79 for about a 17 cent gain of another $7,000. The total over the last year and a half was now up to 86,000. After commission, you still netted 6,900 on the 7,000. Okay. Now, the other thing is, is that it missed the balance of this rally. Remember, everyone. Gasoline rallied clear to the end of February, up to almost, what, 198, 199 a gallon? But it didn't maintain this long for the whole position. But I'll show you a chart afterwards. But it did catch you a short on March the 6th at $1.89. And it held it till March 19th. This was our first trade. Actually made $3,900, our first live trade. Second trade went, tried to go long on the 25th. The market reversed back and immediately kicked us out the very next day. Bought it at one, it's kind of a freak thing, bought it at 180.36 and it sold it out the very next day at 180.36. We made our loss no money. I think we had a few people that actually lost about $300, $311 a contract on some slippage uh, on the market orders that were, that were generated uh, just because they were not all filled at the exact same price. But you can see the commission was the loss over here. And then it took a short position on March 31st for the first couple of days. It was a it was a big winner. Gasoline has since turned and rallied back, and it bought it back on April the 2nd at 182. It lost $1,134 a contract. So it, it does have losers. If the market's not doing what it wants to do right away, it does kick you out. And the system is getting ready to take a long position tonight in the gasoline market. Uh, so it's starting to look look favorable for another potential rally in the market. But over the last 12 months, one contractor, 42,000 gallon, has produced a net profit of 55,000. Just since the first of the year, trading one contract, you would be up $14,000. So you can see how you can add this back to the retail margins. 
even if you're an end user, what I'd like to point out is skip the equity curve, and I want to show you. These are the system's actual trades. We have a large grocery store chain that hedges all their, their transportation fuel for, for their distribution, for all their trucking and semis to us. In their bylaws, they have to maintain a long futures position in the diesel fuel market. So they always have to have a long position as a hedge. All right, But if they would go, and last year they probably wired in over $12 million in capital to maintain that long or to margin that long position. All right, But if they would go to our algorithm hedge trading system, and if the algo system is telling them there's no reason to be short or no reason to be long the market, these are all sell signals, short one, short one. And the blue line is a positive gain. The red line would be a losing would be a losing trade. So you can see it kicks you into short, but the market did not want to go the direction it wanted to go immediately. Bounced up that next day, it kicks you out. It tries to go short again. It was right for a couple of days, but then the market tries to recover. You did kick it kicked you out with a small profit. But even though the trend is still trying to go down, it takes another short. The market starts to fall. But immediately when it starts to come back up, it takes profit again. A couple days go by, and another sell signal kicks in based on the system's parameters. This time when the market starts its collapse, it catches the whole ride on this move. Here's another nice trade. Kicks you out again, but then it picks up another short. And then it goes long. And then because of this big down day, it caused the system to want to kick you out to make sure that it kicks you with a profit. But it missed this. And this big gap here was the rollover between March and April, which was the RVP rollover on gasoline, where April was trading as much as 20-some cents higher than the, than the March futures. But it missed this big run-up. But it did get you short again up here at this 189 and pick up another 9 cents down. Or 17 cents? No, 9. 189 to 181 into that area. And then here's the couple of trades where it uh, got you in and out. Small loss and another small loss here. So this is how the, the system is, looks when it's actually in trade mode. But what I'd like to point out is, is that with this transportation firm, they are looking at the system from the fact of, look, if the algo system is telling me not to be long the market, then we don't need this long position. It could have saved us $12 million in working capital. But then they're also looking at it as, OK, if other large commercial traders are using this algo system and to help improve their own margins, then maybe we should also be taking the short position. Because they also tell us that we become more efficient hedgers when we're in the market at all time. We're not going to take we're not going to make money all the way down. For example, in the gasoline when the sell off started back last July or, or in June, our algo system actually picked up ninety six cents the dollar forty sell off. That's about 66% of the whole sell-off. So it's not going to pick up 100% of the downward slide. But it's going to pick up a large portion of it. But you can see that if you're in the market at all times, you're picking up money from both, both sides of the market now. From a retailer's perspective, your margins are always wanting to get pinched in that higher when that futures market wants to rally. That's where the system is starting to gain in value in an upward market. But you're always losing value as well in your own storage tanks as the market's going down. So hence, the short hedge is also coming in to help offset those risks or those losses. So this is something that I think that uh, a lot of you need to look at. Uh, it, it is a drastic change in what you're used to from a hedge program because you're actually now kind of hands off. And you're now letting a computer take, take control of the situation. What you do is you allocate your volume into something like this, and that you still are going to have to watch it close. Uh, there's no guarantees that, that the system will ever continue to work in the future. And that's one thing that, that all algo riders will tell you. The market will never trade exactly the way it has in the past in the future. But what they do is they can go back. The computers have these ability today, the software programs, and be able to pull out the most optimal pattern that should continue into the future. Okay, That should. It doesn't mean it will. 
That's why about 45 to 50 percent of the trades are profitable, or 54 percent of the trades are profitable, 45 percent of them weren't. You can find some of the other trade systems that will be 80 percent profitable, but then they only make $1,000 for every 3,000 they lose. In other words, they, you're in the trades much longer and you have to weather through a margining position. It may not kick you out of this short until you get past all this congestion. What we have is a system that's devised to, if we're wrong, to immediately kick you out with smaller losses. That's why your profit to loss ratio is about a 4.0 to 1. This goes in conjunction with a lot of you may have heard or even seen or even been in to our retail gasoline margin hedge strategy that we've done over the last 15 years. It's actually a seasonal algorithm. But instead of trading through an average of three times a month, our retail gasoline margin head strategy only traded once a year. And that's where you come in and you pull out, uh, you ask the computer, what's the most optimal time to buy gasoline every year? And every, every year for the last 15 years, we've been buying it into this, going into the December and holding it in towards the end of March, going even into April. And it's worked every year for the last 15 years until this year. And you can see this year on December 1st, April gasoline was 209, but by the time you got to March 29th, or March 30th, it was trading at 179.80. You were down as much as 30 cents a gallon, or lost 12,000 bucks a contract had you held the thing the whole way. But as you can see, over the last 15 years, gasoline has had such a strong seasonal tendency to rally from December into the end of March that it's made money in that time frame every single year for the last 15 years. However, here's what's interesting. Prior to 1999, the seasonal never worked. What changed was the Clean Air Act in 2000. They went to that reed vapor pressure or RVP switchover from winter blend gasoline to a summer blend gas. So every fall they switch from summer gas to a winter RVP gas and that's what it's easier to make, it, it's easier uh, and cheaper to make. Gasoline stocks build and hence prices go down into the winter and then it makes for a great buying opportunity in the middle of winter, and then every March, refineries have to switch over to make a summer blend gas. Combine that with the summer demand increase, and it would cause gasoline to rally every single year, except for this year. This is that one anomaly out of 15. We fully expect all the seasonals to return back to their proper form here by the end of this year, and look for our retail gasoline margin edge strategy to continue to work. And then what we'd like to be able to do is you can combine the the ALGO hedge program with it to lay off your downside price risk. All right, what I'd like to step into now is show you Aaron, one more Aaron, thing. A couple quick questions. Um, was it three trades per month that the ALGO uh, averaged? Yes, How many right, trades at, per month? right about three trades per month. Okay, and then you, you talk quite a bit about the benefits. Um, what, what are the drawbacks of going to the ALGO strategy? I mean, there's a loss of control a little bit. Um, yeah, there's a there's the a do it. Yeah, by letting the computer do it, you're putting complete faith in it in the computer. Uh, there is always the chance that that the system can always go haywire. You've heard some of those on TV about the night flash crash. Yeah, <laughs> or something like that. Uh, they have to be monitored. They have to be controlled. And uh, our our system, what we'd like to be able to do is it's uh, built to only enter on the opening and exit on the opening. And that's uh, at 5 p.m. Central Time. Uh, the market closes at 4.15 Central Time and opens again at 5 o'clock. And so our system is built to only do it at those time frames. So you're not getting caught up into a big uh, downward or upward push during intra-trade. And we feel over the last year and a half, the system has tried to take those into account. Even uh, you know, if you get caught into one and it starts going the wrong direction, you can see that the largest loss the largest losing trade, if it's in here, here's an equity curve. So it starts out well. The flat lines are, are flat periods where it's got no trade. But you'll go through some periods of drawdowns. Yeah. And, and essentially, to your point, Darren, is you know, the vast majority of trades out there are computer driven today. And, and this industry is a little bit behind in that, uh, that manner. And uh, it's probably a matter of time till it moves how the big firms in Wall Street are doing it. And Jed, it is. And actually, I would say that 
that the majority of us that are on, on this call today, our size of business is probably behind the curve. You know, we've been actually looking at this for the last two years. Um, you know, our large commercial hedgers uh, come to us and say, look, you need to be looking more into this type of a program. It, here's what it's done for us. Uh, it's actually made us a much more efficient hedger. We're catching the moves that, you know, we haven't caught in the past. It's getting us in quicker. It's getting us out quicker. Um, you know, it's taking care of it when I'm not here to watch it. It's, you know, for all those individuals. And what it's doing also is, is that they're saying, look, we're now going to have to stay in the market at all times if we're going to be efficient. Mm -hmm. So we need to be able to take profit from those shorts as well as those longs. Well, and then Darren, I, I know in the sake of folks' time, if uh, you got one other strategy you'd like to kind of step through, and if, if you can do that in the next 10 minutes here, it'd be, be great. Absolutely. Uh, what I'd also like to introduce to you is a diesel fuel or gasoline maximum price contract strategy. And th this type of strategy, everybody's heard of a cap, doing a cap contract. Uh, many of you have heard it, but there's not many of you that actually implement it. What I'd like to do is go over it today because now would be an ideal time to go out there and offer this to your end user customer base. And I'm going to do the example in diesel fuel real quick. Uh, and if you'd like to follow up on it, please give me a call or, or give me an email. And I'd be even happy to do a private webinar for you on any of these programs to show, show deeper data and, and more detail on how you need to handle this. But a maximum price contract, capture upside price risk while allowing your customer to participate in 100% of the downside. Now that's, that, that's the saying an awful lot. If you can come in there and you can cap a customer's upside price risk while allowing them to participate in the downside, boy, right now I know a lot of people that were stuck in, in fixed price contracts. As a jobber, your customers that are stuck in them, they're having trouble trying to pay for them. Um, they're trying to back out of them. They never want to pull them until the very end of the month. Uh, after a move like we've just had, they become a very problematic contract for you. As you learn how to use this, this maximum price contract can be one of the most important cash contract programs you offer to your end user customer base. Not to go through all the wording, but here's how this program works. If a futures price is at 176, and I'm going to look at a May through October time frame, and we're going to go look at a rack price. The futures are at 176 and our rack price is at 191. All right, you're going to take your rack price at 191. You've got trucking of four cents. You want to have a 15 cent margin. So you're going to have a maximum price here of, of about 210. All right, what you do is you can go to your end user supplier and you can do a fixed forward contract for the month of May for 42,000 gallons, one for June, one for July, one for August, one September in one October. So you've got a larger end user customer that can handle 42,000 a month. If not, you want to bundle several of your customers together. Maybe four of them and they each take 10,000 gallons apiece. You do the fixed forward. All right, the fixed forward capture upside price risk. So you want to add the trucking. You want to add your desired margin. Now you're at 210 a gallon. All right, that's the price you're going to go out to the customer but you still have the downside risk. What you then do is at the same time you buy the fixed forward and, and have your contract signed from your customer, you buy a put option on the New York Mercantile Exchange. This option will cost probably about $0.08 cents a gallon for a May, $0.10 cents a gallon for the June, 12 for the July, 13, 14, 15. They increase in time as you go out. Now what you do is you tell the customer, when you normally collect some money up front, you tell the customer, look, for, and on this strip, and when I say strip, now we're looking at the time frame from May through October. So on this time frame here, the average cost of this option is going to be 12 cents. So hey, Mr. Customer, for 12 cents down non-refundable, I'll give you a maximum price or a cap contract that will protect 100% of your upside from 210, and I'll give you all the downside, whatever our daily book price is when I, when I haul the fuel out. All right, now your customer is thinking about that and going, man, you can tell your customer he can now come in on budget or under budget. He can go home and sleep every night and not have to worry about that he's speculating in the market. His upside is protected, but if he's wrong, 
for an, an average of $0.12 cents a gallon for the next six months, he's able to participate in all the downside. The average daily trading range is almost $0.06 cents a gallon. The average weekly trading range is over $0.06 cents a gallon. The average monthly trading range in diesel fuel is about $0.24 cents a gallon. To spend $0.12 cents over the next six months, and all he is doing is he's buying an insurance policy to protect his downside price risk. He buys insurance on everything else that he does. Now he's just buying it to insure the price of his fuel. You know how many trucking firms I've talked to in the last year or in the last six months that can now are having trouble going out and bidding on freight rates because they're stuck in take-or-pay contracts. They're very expensive. Your municipalities love this kind of stuff. They can now come in on budget or under budget. People got laxed in the last several years in diesel fuel, especially because of the sideways market. I've seen some C stores last fall going into Thanksgiving that thought, man, this gasoline is cheap. I want to go in there and buy the next six months or a year's worth of gasoline. They tell their supplier to go and book their fuel. They go and book the fuel, and now they find out that they're still 80 cents out of the market, or even 60 cents out of the market. But yet those guys, uh, uh, this, the C-store owner, is now having trouble paying for that gasoline. He knows I can't sell it for that kind of a loss or I'll be out of business. Now he's trying to work a deal with suppliers to, to bleed that into his, into his margin over the next couple of years. There's no reason why you'd want to have to finance or carry a guy like that. But if he did it on a max price contract, now granted, a C-store guy can't hardly do it because of the cost of 8 to 10 to 12 cents a gallon because that is his entire market. That's where you've got to do a retail margin hedge or even do an algo type hedge to where it's protecting you in either direction of the market and you're not paying out a premium. But all your end users, especially your trucking firms and your, and your gasoline fleet users, love these kind of things because they know they can always, especially, you got to go see the CFO. You can't just walk in and talk to the guy in the shop. you got to hit that CFO and he knows he's going to be able to come in on budget or under budget He's not going to have to watch it, and he can walk away from it. And there's more here that we can go through, Jed, if we've got a little bit more time. Uh, a few more sales type things that you'd want to bring up. The strategy gets the customer to sign a longer term contract with you. And it's better program than that fixed price because he's not going to be stuck in that take or pay. You're going to take a customer's eyes off the daily price swings and getting him away from shopping the market. And I know some of you are going to ask, well, I don't have a supplier that will do a fixed price. Then what you can do is you can buy the call option to protect your upside price swings instead of the put option. Or buy futures and buy the put. These are the details that I need to explain to you on the side if you're going to get serious about doing a program like this. But this strategy has so many pluses that it should be one of your mainstay products that you offer out to your end user customers. The strategy gives you something other than your impeccable service and your high-quality fuels to go sell. You know what's, what's one of the biggest attributes to this program is I found after the years of selling it, I have some municipalities and some large end-user firms that at, towards the end of each year, they'll call up and say, what can I cap my price at for 2015? They'll ask. They say, go get it done. They no longer really want to just discuss the price. They just look for something that they can put in their budget, that they're going to come in on budget or under budget. And that's what's so important. When your salesman goes in there, after he's, after he's educated his customer on this, he can do a three-month. He can do a, do a one-month, three-month, six-month, 12-month, okay, of, of, a, of a cap or a maximum price program. And what, what this will do is it will protect their upside price risk. And that, that's what I can't... Uh, stress enough, as well as having your downside ability to participate in a, in a big sell-off. Truck stops, card lock managers, boy, what you need to do is get a hold of those people that are coming into your card lock or your own truck stops. Take those credit card receipts, use them, get the phone numbers off of them, call those people. You know how you can increase the gallons into your own card lock or truck stop by calling these trucking firms? You can call these national fleets that have been coming through and tell them, hey, look, 
I can cap you here on as much as 40 some thousand gallon a month, 60,000, 80,000. Send your trucks in here. I got another one over at this other location off of exit something. Stop in here. You can start now directing the traffic and getting more uh, national fleets to come by and stop in your location. Even if you're in a large city, now you can go get more of your own construction firms and the other smaller fleets to come in and start using your own card. It has a great tool to it. You can actually add a penny to the maximum price. Instead of 12 cents, make it 13 or 14 to cover your extra costs for your, for your management fees on here. But again, one of the biggest selling points is you are no longer selling price. You're, a, you're actually selling a cap or maximum price contract. And once you've done this, and they've, they've done it once or twice, and they've gone through a big sell-off in the market, they understand why they're doing it each year, and the, they start getting used to paying the premium. But, you know, I've seen it over the years past as well. When you do it for a couple of years, and they feel like they're losing the premium year after year, the market just keeps going sideways to higher, like it did over the last few years. But then it's so much better not to have a customer stuck in this. For example, last fall, the diesel fuel market was trading at three bucks. Here's ISIS going into Iraq. We also even put out the recommendation to our customer base in this June time frame to do a maximum price contract and cap your diesel fuel price risk because we felt if ISIS went on into Saudi Arabia or even on into Kuwait that we felt there was going to be a bigger upside price risk. So we told them for eight, 10 cents a gallon for July through December, volatility was extremely low. The options were the cheapest they'd been in 10 years last summer. They were able to cap their upside price risk for the balance of the year out to eight cents a gallon. The best thing that ever happened happened to them. The market collapsed. And they were able to continue to go buy fuel cheaper every day. And the only thing they were out was that eight to 10 cents a gallon they spent for the insurance but they were not locked into that fixed price take or pay. And the market just continued to collapse. Here's the OPEC meeting stabilized in here. After OPEC, you get another big washout all the way down into the January time frame. But even in diesel fuel, we'll look at this bounce from 158 all the way back up here into this area, 225, back down here to this 165. Okay. Thanks, Darren. Um, one kind of general point that I think comes to me as I watch you step through a couple of these strategies is just to make sure that, you know, whoever's implementing these knows the difference between what I would say hedging and speculation and uh, to, to, to understand, you know, what, what could go wrong and what could go against them and to be sure that that's, you know, really a hedge strategy and, you know, not something that they're, they're blind to that, uh, you know, could really do damage to them. That, exactly, and that's why we'd like to be able to work with somebody individually um, to educate them in this process. And we do the hand-holding and try and help educate you to line up the gallons on the back side of this. So if you're doing a maximum price program and you want to go out and offer it, to, if you're an agricultural uh, co-op type guy or a Midwest diesel fuel guy, you've got to pool your farmers together to do that spring or summer contract. Uh, if you're in a large metro area, you want to go out and pool your largest commercial type counts together on this and make sure that you've got the end users signed up on this before we go and commit to buying a fixed forward or, or the options to protect your upside price risk or protect your downside price risk. So we want to work with you and do the hand-holding to coach you through this. You know, there's also some basis risk. If you don't do a fixed forward, and the markets get tight, refineries go down. What happens if the cash market outruns the futures market? What happens if the cash market goes down quicker than the futures market, like it did last winter in the Chicago market? How do you handle those kind of risks? Those are some of the other details that you need to know to run a hedge program on and, and manage your risk on these type of things. Hmm. Those things need to be written in those cash contracts to your customers to absorb or or take on some of that basis risk. Well, thank you, thank you very much, Darren, for sharing all this with us. I, I thought it was interesting to kind of get your perspective on where crude oil prices may go and some of the supply and demand fundamentals. And I know you just shared a, you know, a couple strategies. Uh, certainly, there are many programs out there uh, 
uh, for differing needs of petroleum marketers that you know can help them uh, mitigate some of that that risk um, that, that they do have out there. Um, appreciate everybody being on the call here with Darren uh, today. Uh, if you have any questions uh, directly for Darren, he'd be very happy to uh, answer those. You can see his email uh, and phone number right there on the screen in front of you. Uh, he, he'd enjoy having a you know conversation uh, about about anything. And um, again, appreciate the time on the call and. Hope you guys have a great day. Bye. Thank you very much.